Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile cart or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at 1-877-986-7771 and get your sales rolling. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. Order today at PureSoapFlakes.com. Or give them a call, 218-568-2525, 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. Tina Helmuth is writing an ongoing series of fact fiction books that boldly takes on today's most heinous crimes. The abduction, sexual trafficking, and cannibalization of our children. Suffer the little children, the wrath of the father, and unbreakable. Deeply researched and mixed with the supernatural, good versus evil makes these thrillers hard to put down, shining a light on the root cause of these crimes and introducing a spiritual solution. Justice will be served. Available at lulu.com in paperback or ebook. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and P.I. Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, I forgot to turn on my, <laughs> unmute my mic. <laughs> Welcome to the Offerman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Offerman, uh, president of our Offerman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting. You can get a hold of me through my website, emailrevealer.com. You can go there and get an autographed copy of my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator. And if you want to check out our free archives, you can go to spreaker.com. They got a chat room on there. If you sign up, become a follower. If you follow on Spreaker for free, uh, you get an email notification anytime I broadcast a live content. Tonight's show is live. Um, and then uh, what's the other thing, too, is okay, OppermanReport.com. That's where we have our members section. That's how you can support the show by stay, becoming a member. You get access to all kinds of exclusive content. I just did a show the other um, last week. I'm going to be putting up in there an interview. Some guy interviewed me. I think he was a wrestler or something. I'm not sure what was going on. And John Brissom was on there with me. I don't know, I don't know what was going on with that whole thing, but uh, you know, it was on Truth Frequency Radio, you know. And uh, I don't know what was going on. Anyway, we talked about some stuff, Epstein and the election. I, I, yeah, I think we were talking about the election or something. Anyway, so that's going to go up there in the member section. I got a little passionate toward the end there, talking about socialism and the nationalizing the old industry. Anyway, let's move on. Got some really good content coming up this week. I want you to keep your eye out for it. I did an interview with Lisa Peace, uh, who was, uh, wrote this great new book about the RFK assassination. And in her her uh, uh, theory and all this, from her research, a very well-documented research, is that it leads to Robert Mayhew, uh, who, as you may know, is a Las Vegas resident here in Nevada. Well, he's dead now. Uh, but I, I've actually been to his house. Uh, when, when I first moved to Nevada, I was taken to his house to, to meet him. I didn't know I was meeting Bob Mayhew. I thought I was meeting somebody who uh, had some information that they could buy and sell for me. 
uh, or I was going to be buying and selling information for that this source. And I had breakfast over at his house. A friend of mine took me over. Uh, I didn't put two and two together until shortly after that it was the you know Bob May who uh, just didn't put it together. A lot of things seem to slip by me. <laughs> okay. Then another uh, interesting interview I did with um, uh, Catherine Ellison about this book. Uh, uh, <laughs> about this book she wrote about mothers and murderers. A uh, very, very nice woman. Very pleasant one. Both of these interviews are very enjoyable. I, I enjoyed both of them. So you can look forward to that coming up this week. Got some really, really good news for... Oh, I don't know if it's good news, you know. But the uh, big news here in Nevada... A uh, case I'm working on, the Byron Williams case. And this gentleman was riding his bike around 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, he didn't have a headlight on the bike, so the cops trying to pull him over. He wasn't having that. He tried to make a run for it. He chased him down. He surrendered. And then they applied pressure. They, uh, the cops got on top of him with their knees until uh, he died. He was yelling out there a uh, hundred times, uh, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. So I had the family on the show here to publicize this event, and then we got him an attorney. I hooked him up with my client, Keith Davidson, and uh, he took on the case, which is a big deal. He's a big Beverly Hills attorney, you know, he testified for Congress, uh, involved in a lot of big stuff, man. He took on this case, and then it was just ruled uh, by the coroner's office that it was ruled a homicide, which is a death caused by another. It was caused by pressure applied to his back which points to the cops that were arresting him. So there is a chance that these cops could be getting arrested. It, it has to be referred uh, to the uh, a criminal referral, and then it would have to be referred to the DA's office for prosecution. And it turns out that when local reporters called up our district attorney here, Mr. Wolfson, he hung up on him. He wasn't interested in discussing this case with them. So it's kind of a wonder why that would be. Why would that be? If, if you, you have a citizen, a voter taxpayer a victim of a homicide it's been ruled a homicide and you call to ask the da if they're going to prosecute and you get hung up on it well how's that work you know doesn't make much sense to me it's lvmpd the las vegas metro police department people uh, like to get that wrong <laughs> anyway uh, we don't know how they're handling it yet we're going to find out anyway so that's going on that's going on what else is up okay uh, we're going to get right into it because I don't have any notes tonight. Okay, Like usually I'll have all these notes and I wrote a bunch of notes uh, during the week. I was going to talk about Benghazi and the similarities between what happened in Benghazi and what's going on right now in Syria. And how people that were so upset about Benghazi don't be, seem to be upset about what's going on in Syria right now. You would think these patriots uh, would uh, be concerned you know, that we're selling out our soul, that we're cutting and running. You know, and, uh, and there's this chaos going on here with uh, in Syria, but uh, you know, they don't seem to care. So I guess you would have to keep your mouth shut about Benghazi going forward, wouldn't you? <laughs> All these people that were so obsessed with Benghazi. Half of them didn't even know where Benghazi was. I would tell them, I told them my Libya, and they'd say, what do you want my Libya? We're just going to Benghazi. <laughs> Benghazi's in Libya, you nut. Anyway, let's move on. Because like I said, I got no notes. And I was going to talk all about stuff, too, about uh, how times have changed and uh, the youth of today. And uh, I, but I, I, for other reasons, I can't get into that tonight either. OK, for anyway, so we're going to move on. Uh, tonight's show is called uh, My Personal Experience with Hookers. And uh, I often do these shows that, that begin my personal experience with and like Art Bell or uh uh, oh, I can't think of anybody right now. But I've done these other shows. Where I've, I've described my personal experience with somebody who's in the media or the alt media or in the news. And I describe my personal experience with them. Keith Hernandez. <laughs> That's one. Yeah, and I tell my little story. Uh, so there's a story in the news right now that Jim Fetzer uh, just lost a lawsuit. He was sued for libel and slander by one of the parents of the kids killed at Sandy Hook. Hey, hookers. <laughs> okay. What, were you thinking I was talking about something else? I was talking about the Sandy Hookers. Okay. So this gentleman here, uh, what's his name? 
uh, Noah Posner, who was the father of one of these victims, uh, sued for defamation, harassment, libel, slander against uh, uh, Jim Fetzer, who wrote this book, uh, Nothing Happened at Sandy Hook. And he lost. Fetzer lost big time, $450,000 in damages. Now, a little background here as far as defamation libel lawsuits go. Uh, when I was 25 years old, I sued someone for defamation and slander. And uh, so I have a little experience with defamation lawsuits. I got, later on in my life, I was a witness in one case, the Art Bell lawsuit, where he sued a couple of folks for defamation and slander, and I was a witness in that case. Uh, after that, I, when I've been started working as a digital forensic investigator, doing um, a, creating exhibits from information on the internet, I've been hired many, many times to compile evidence of internet defamation for defamation lawsuits. And it's very difficult to get a defamation lawsuit off the ground. You have to come up with money out of your own pocket. No one expects to get a $450,000 settlement. That's unheard of. Okay? This is a pretty clear-cut case here that, that Mr. Fetzer blew it. Because uh, what he, he claimed that um, Mr. Posner here faked his son's death certificate. So all Posner has to come in and prove is, you know, hey, here's the real death certificate, you know, and uh, that uh, Fetzer was acting with malice, and Fetzer's lost his case, okay? Now, let me tell you about my personal experience with Jim Fetzer. A lot of people would be talking about this case, but I don't know many, how many of them actually know Jim Fetzer. I had Jim Fetzer on my show. We had a, we were on the same radio station there for a little while, and uh, I, I did the show with Jim Fetzer, and Oli Damagard. I had Oli Damagard on the show once. We were talking about, I forget what the topic was. I think it was this uh, assassination that took place in Europe. Um, and he had some really done some good research on it. And I liked the guy. And uh, I get contacted by this woman named Lorian Fenton. You might remember her. She was the manageress. <laughs> the manageress for Douglas Dietrich. Okay, so this is years and years and years ago when I first started on that station. And I was friendly with Doug. And his manageress, which she used to call her, was Lorian Fenton. Since this time, they parted ways. And she contacts me. And at the time, I thought she was legit. She contacts me and she says, Ed, you got to help my friends. They've un uncovered all this information about these assassinations and these serial killers. And, and they're involved in all these assassinations. And they've got tapes and stuff like that. They've done all this great work. It's Jim Fetzer. And we're worried he's going to, he's coming out with this information and we's, we're worried he's going to get killed. They're going to kill him to silence him. So we need you to do a show about this as quickly as you can. And I said, well, boy, this must be serious. Okay, you know, sounds serious. We need to do a show about this right away. So we actually rushed and we did a special broadcast on a Saturday afternoon. My show was fr uh, on a uh, Thursdays, if that's no, either Thursdays or Fridays, who knows? But we rushed. We did a special broadcast on a Saturday afternoon with Jim Fetzer and Only Damagard. But they wanted to play some audio recordings over the show, so I wasn't able to do this at the time. I wasn't capable of doing this. I just used to make a Skype call into the station's uh, server there and broadcast over their equipment. So we needed someone to host the call besides myself that had the ability to play these recordings over the air. So we had to bring in a third person, okay? Now, since uh, that time, I have discovered some things about this third person uh, that um, are unsettling to me. Um, but unbeknownst to me, until the day of the broadcast, it turned out that uh, Mr. Fetzer and this producer had been in contact with each other in communications and had really gone over in great detail, you know, the, uh, the sequence of these recordings they wanted to play. And it was a whole little uh, cooperation going on between these two behind my back. So we did the interview and we started off. I started becoming uncomfortable with the interview right away because it was just so thin. All the uh, 
uh, the, the research and the evidence and everything in this inter- interview was very thin, you know, to, to claim that uh, these people were involved in these you know, all these assassinations, JFK, they were involved in it, they were involved in this one and that one, everything, you know, and it was just it wasn't there. I didn't see it. But, you know, I took the statement and we went through the, the interview and in the very end, when I'm wrapping up the show, Fetzer starts screaming into the microphone. Screaming over me as I'm saying, okay, guys, good night, thank you. <laughs> he starts screaming into the microphone about Sandy Hook. Now, and then I realized, hey, whoa, I have no ability to hang up on this guy. <laughs> I have, I've lost control of this. this. It's the first and the last time I've ever allowed that to happen when I'm on the air that I didn't have the ability to shut down uh, a, a loose cannon. A runaway guest who hijacked my show. Okay, so the show's over, and I decided, well, I said, I'm never going to deal with the Fetzer again, ever. I, I tried to give Oli Demogard a couple of chances after that, but nothing ever materialized. I, I, I lost interest in him. Uh, and I've always been unsettled by that incident. Okay, and, I, and looking back today, I think the whole thing was a setup from the start. I don't trust the woman who set up the interview. I don't trust the person who was running the board. I didn't. My producer at the time, I, I it turned out to be a total fraud, catfish, uh, who lied about everything about her life, every detail about her life. She was lying about. Okay. I'll, I'll leave, man, she was stalking Dave McGowan in his hospital bed. All right. There's a lot of stuff goes on here, you guys. You don't know about. Yeah. I've been replaying a lot of Dave McGowan this week, so I figured I'd throw that out there. Very troubling time. So, I put Fetzer on the shelf. And what happened is later on, I had this guest on. Uh, we were talking about uh, Vince Foster death. And I wound up in this email loop. Okay. And this guy used to send out these emails all the time with his research and his information and stuff. And a lot of them were, you know, a little offensive to me, you know, talking about the, the Zionists and the, the globalists, you know, and I had all these little code words, you know, and pretty much Jew hate, you know, uh, but he, he was very careful to couch it, you know. But then this last one he sends me was just blatant bigotry, man. It was just blatant Jew hate. Uh, attack of an entire race, an entire faith, an entire group of people. Uh, and painting them all with the same brush. Uh, out of anti-Semitic Jew hate. You can't paint a good picture of this. And I finally told the guy, I emailed back and I said, look, man, that's it. Take me off your list. I want no part of you. Okay. And I get a response from good old Jim Fetzer with a bunch of links, <laughs> okay, about how evil the Jews are and how bad the Jews are. There's blatant anti-Semitism. It wasn't anti-Zionism. It wasn't anti-globalism. All this other stuff you, you hear, okay? This was blatant bigotry, anti-Semitism, and I was done with Fetzer for the rest of my life at that point. That's my experience with Fetzer, Okay. And uh, a lot of times when I'll do these shows, my personal experience with something, I'll mention the guy's name, but I don't want to draw out. I've regretted doing that the past couple of times because you draw out these uh, folks that are just a little obsessed. I'm talking to my audience. Okay? And people who like hookers. <laughs> okay. Now, what's my experience with Sandy Hook and Sandy Hookers? Let me tell you that. All right. Hey, how are we doing here on time? Oh, not bad. Okay, good. Because I, I got a whole other topic I want to talk about. I, I, if you're getting bored with me now, I may be talking about John Walsh, uh, the father of Adam Walsh, because I did a, a repeat. I played a repeat this week about the interview I did with this gentleman who was an eyewitness to seeing Jeffrey Dahmer abduct Adam Walsh. And this has brought up some conversation on my YouTube channel and other places. Uh, people discussing Adam Walsh and John Walsh and stuff like that. And I have a personal experience with Adam Walsh as well. John Walsh. And his character named John uh, Hank Asher. Well, I met them both at a PI conference here in Nevada. 
So I had a little personal experience with that too as well. But let me tell you about my personal experience with these hookers. These Sandy hookers. Now, just like everyone else, you know, when a tragedy happened at Sandy Hook, you started seeing these uh, YouTube videos. Making all these kinds of uh, allegations and claims and presenting all this evidence and these theories that the whole thing was a big hoax. And some even said that nobody died. And there were a lot of, when you watch these things, you see a lot of suspicious stuff. You know, some of the parents are laughing before they go on TV. Uh, the coroner or the medical examiner was saying some weird hokey stuff too. This whole business of that they're walking in, there's an aerial photo of this crowd walking around in this big giant circle, just walking around and passing by each other. Uh, signs about, you know, checking here, staging area, you know, stuff like that. Uh, these different things you hear, you know. And you see, watch these videos, and you listen to these discussions and talks about it, and, and you think, whoa, there's something really weird going on here. Then you start seeing other videos debunking those videos. But then you think, ah, you know, maybe this guy's a shill, whatever, who knows. So, like everyone else, I had my suspicions and I kind of, you know, I thought, hey, man, there's something weird going on here. But then I started meeting these people, okay? I started meeting some of these folks who were obsessed with Sandy Hook and had done some of these videos. And at the very best, I don't think I, I came away with a good experience with any of them, ever. One of the best ones I can think of was just an irresponsible guy who just acted uh, irresponsibly and unethically. And, um, you know, was kind of bragging about things he couldn't really do. And and uh, just kind of a blowhard type guy. That's kind of one of the best ones. Some of these guys I dealt with were outright insane and dangerous. What is nuts was stalking me? He's crazy. Now, on top of that, though, uh, a couple of these big names actually came to me and tried to hire me, okay, to work for them in their various troubles in their personal life and their their uh, activities and their, the problems they caused themselves because of their activities. And they were just so bizarre. And plus, they couldn't afford to pay me, you know, but they were just so bizarre. I, I wouldn't even take their cases. All right. So, you know, I had a real bad experience with that bunch, you know, and, and when I look back at them, I can't think of one person in that whole group of Sandy hookers uh, that had that I come away with any confidence in their credibility. None whatsoever. Then as time goes on, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm in this area of this, these type of discussions, people who like to, you know, uh, question the official story, as they like to say. The next thing that comes up in my life is the, uh, the Bundy Ranch story, right? And living here in Nevada, you know, just miles, a couple hours, an hour away from Bundy Ranch. And I just happened to be up there a week before and I saw the cops staging. I'm up there for one of Victoria's uh, basketball games. And I started seeing the reporting on Bundy Ranch and, and the people behind the scenes and that. And I, and I says, well, whoa, look at this, man. You, you watch these YouTube videos and you listen to these internet radio shows and they're talking about Bundy Ranch and they've got it all wrong. They got the, the, the geography wrong. Some people have it out there by Prim. Some people think it's by Lake Mead. They don't even know. They don't even have the basic stuff correct. And then the biggest story around Bundy Ranch is the story of the Millers. This couple who, who uh, were up at Bundy Ranch, they started, they were there part of a big showdown between the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters. And, and then they were, they were the ones who started the rumor that there was going to be a drone strike when they got kicked out of there. And it just so ha and then they came down and back to Vegas. They got kicked out of Bundy Ranch. They came to back to Vegas here and they wind up shooting two cops in a Walmart. No, no, they shot, they shot him out of CeCe's Pizza. Then they got shot and killed by the cops in a Walmart. There's so much discrepancies in this story and holes in this story. And these two were obvious some kind of agents. They were at a million man mask march. They were at Occupy Wall Street. Then suddenly they fly out here, sell all their possessions, show up in Nevada, uh, show up out here and uh, uh, to, to follow uh, 
Mr. Vanderbeek, another guest that I had on my show that was running for, for governor, I hosted the governor's debate. So I knew him personally, so I knew people around this whole story. I got all the behind-the-scenes information on this. We pulled up police reports. We found out these millers were, were police informants here in Vegas. And and the official story is, is they, they one day they got a shopping cart, and they filled it with weapons and a flag, and they pushed the shopping cart three miles in the Las Vegas heat to a CC's pizzeria and get the drop on two armed cops to Las Vegas. That's the official story? And then somehow they make it across the street to a Walmart and they declare the revolution starting and they fire a gun in here. And somehow they wind up dead. And then there's like a police, a military vehicle that somehow gets to Walmart uh, within minutes and blocks the, the exits. Um, you know, the whole story. And, then, and there's video from Walmart. It's all grainy. It's, it doesn't look. You walk into a Walmart. You look up at the TV set. When you walk in there, you can see the quality of the video that they got of you. But they don't have that video. What's going on here? One hole after another. Okay. But do you, I'm asking you right now, have you heard anybody besides me talk about that story? Tell you what I just told you right now? No one talks about that. That's the biggest story of Bundy Ranch. No one talks about it. All right. Now, and also, too, that again, goes back to that station, too. They dropped everything, okay, and redid the schedule and let me do a live broadcast to talk about this Jim Fetzer, Okay. But when I had the goods on his Miller story, no, no, we don't want to be bothered with that, Ed. I go to bed around that time. I don't want to play your show for you. John B. Wells put me on. I was all over the place with that story. Uh, Google the Opperman Report, the Millers. Okay. Then we have the October 1st shooting here in Las Vegas. And I start seeing all these stories. The same folks who talk about Sandy Hook. Same folks, misreporting all the stuff that really went on at the Bundy Ranch. Now they're all experts on October 1st, the Mandalay Bay shooting here. And they come up with this incredibly bizarre theory about the, the Four Seasons. And, and, and a, a, a really sticking point for me, too, a sore point, is they always say LVPD, Las Vegas Police Department. There's no such thing as LVPD. It's LV Metro Police Department. LVMPD. Okay. But uh, they don't care, you know. Eh, I'm going to do a report on the LVPD. I'm going to do a report on the El Las Vegas coroner's office. There's no Las Vegas. Car it's a Clark County coroner's office. We don't have a Las Vegas coroner's office. Anyway, all this crazy stuff about how the, the Four Seasons owns the top floors. And, you know, and there's a helicopter and there's Arabs. Okay. Now, this I can tell you, because, you know, this happened. This has really hit me close to home. Okay. You know, I, I was up all that night, okay, listening to the police scanner, watching the news, looking on Facebook. This stuff was on my Facebook page before it was ever on any news on TV, even local TV. Friends of mine were talking about this, the shooting that went on down there. Hit very close to home. I had to keep my kid home from school the next day, okay? And then we had to keep her home from school again on Thursday because there was rumors of another shooting was going to happen. The entrance to the highway right by my house was shut down. Okay. So I it quickly, within days, you know, I heard all the, the scanner stuff about, oh, there's a shooting at the M, there's a shooting at the, at the, uh, um, uh, what is that place, the um, Bellagio, all this stuff. I heard all that. And then I heard the responses too with the, the commanders yelling at these guys saying, hey, stop calling in these things until you, you have it verified you see with your own eyes because everybody's panicking running around like a bunch of cowards and a lot went on that night that wasn't reported either in the news or in the alternate uh, media to the truth media okay everybody's making up these wild stories that's you know there was this uh, video of a cab driver okay and you could hear some uh the different sounds of the, the echoes of the, of the gunfire, right? And people are telling me, Ed, you got to interview that cabbie. I, I got to interview. I, I, I talked to a hundred people that were there. Uh, dozens of people that worked in these hotels and the different hotels where people were claiming there were other shooters and there were other shooting incidents. And I talked to, I know these people. We go to church with them. They, my daughter's friends at school, clients, people that have helped, people have bailed out of jail. <laughs> people who come to me when they're in trouble 
But no, you got to talk to this kid. What? Because the cabbie was on YouTube? I got to talk to him? How does that work? <laughs> How does that work? You know? <laughs> it's the crazy. You know, who, who, how do you, what kind of investigation is that? And all these guys. And the further away you live and you're looking at pictures and you're looking at YouTube, you're being more of an expert you are. All right? So I lived here with these people. I personal friends with the, the, the person who ran the Family Resource Center, who was pivotal, uh, coordinated all the interactions with the, the police and the media and the insurance companies and the attorneys and the Red Cross, and all, right at the center of this are the people I know and, and dealt with on a first-hand basis, Okay. And I, I even went down to, to the, uh, what do you call it, the, the press conferences, okay, in person. I, I saw, I, I didn't have to see it on YouTube. I was there in the room, okay, and, and no one here believed. Well, now, I, I ran into one person recently, the first person ever, uh, who said to me, oh, I was there on the strip, and I saw a helicopter, and I saw shooting from a helicopter, and I saw these Arabs walking around giving each other signals and talking into their cell phones. And I thought, oh, my goodness, it's the first time I've ever met anybody that wasn't on the Internet who was here and said they saw this. And I started talking to her. And I, and when I was talking to her, I, I thought she had credibility. It turns out now she has no credibility in other areas. She's just a bad witness, an unreliable person. You got to, you know, have faith in, in your witnesses that they're capable. You know, <laughs> they, they don't fall apart before your eyes. So... After experience firsthand and seeing the crazy reporting, the inaccuracies in the reporting about Bundy Ranch having lived here and, and about the October 1st having lived here and talking, and I really worked on that. I talked to everybody here, man. And there's a lot of stuff that I know that's never made it either into mainstream media or into alternative media. Like, like that they were still finding bodies there at five o'clock in the morning the next day underneath the stage because the cops were too afraid to go in there. OK, and the cops didn't allow the ambulance uh, workers to get in there either. And and the really the people who saved most of the people that day were the stagehands who were working the event. They had these big yellow uh, plastic wheelbarrows. I don't, I don't even know what they were doing with them. And that's a good question. Why did they have all those wheelbarrows? But they had these big wheelbarrows, and they were pulling people in and out with these wheelbarrows. That's how people got saved and were taken to the ambulances and stuff because the cops weren't letting the ambulances go into the, into the venue there to, to pick people up. They had to take them out. And people were climbing over the fences and stuff. They couldn't get out. So uh, there was a lot of stuff that went on, okay? It's not in the media, but it's not all this crazy stuff about uh, the Arabs and the Four Seasons and all sorts of stuff. Uh, do me a favor. All you guys who have this crazy theory about the Four Seasons being owned by the Saudi Arabians, or, okay, look and find one lawsuit out of the thousands of lawsuits in all this that mention the Four Seasons. There's not one. Okay? Not even someone who slipped and fell on, on the property that night. Okay? Yeah, there's nothing. Okay? All that should be dismissed as just being utter nonsense. So that's my uh, another issue I have with Sandy Hook because I'm not there, but you know this, I've dealt with the people who put these videos out there nuts, okay, for the most part, you know, uh, and um, I could just imagine seeing all the errors <laughs> from what I've seen here reported uh, that there must be in, in that reporting. You know, and then and people say, well, Ed, what about, you know, you're a fan of Dave McGowan? Is it? Yeah, you know, but by the way, I, I was putting Dave McGowan on my show before anybody knew who Dave McGowan was. When I when I was a guest on Coast to Coast, I mentioned Dave McGowan and his book on that show. In fact, I don't think the book was out yet. Okay. So I knew Dave McGowan way, way, way back. All right. Uh, before he became this legendary figure. And most people know about Dave McGowan from my show. Uh, and Dave McGowan, at the end of his life, had this big theory about the Boston bombing. Now, it's a different situation, okay? Because if you look at the Boston bombing situation, you got the the, 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 the two uh, bombers. The FBI had been to their house previously. The Russians warned about them. They, their uncle was a CIA agent, you know, you know, a notorious family of CIA people. 
There's witnesses falling out of helicopters, getting shot in interrogation rooms. There's a, it's a whole nother situation, okay, uh, of what went on at the Boston bombing and why that needs to be looked at carefully. Again, I don't live there, but I talked to people who did live there. And Casey Gay Magala uh, knew uh, some people that were probably uh, murdered by those uh, uh, those brothers. Uh, there was a situation that went on there involving drug dealing. I think it was marijuana dealing. Uh, but you can check out those uh, interviews as well in our Spreaker archive. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to play a little commercial uh, break, and I'll come back. I think we're done with the hookers. And we'll get into hookers. The next section would be blow. Uh, hookers and blow, the second part. Now, you know what? I'm going to change the title to my personal experience with hookers and blow. Because uh, the Hank Asher story, Hank was a cocaine smuggler. And right, we'll talk about this when I get back. Oh, great. I don't have a commercial ready. <laughs> okay, I screwed up. I screwed up. All right. I screw up every now and then. What are you going to do, right? Uh, I'm getting old. I'm getting tired. This is a lot of work, man. You know, it's a lot of work doing this show, but it's a lot of work dealing with all the nonsense, man. The, the extra work. You know, it's really amazing how, I guess, like people just want to, like, get into the act. You know, so everybody wants to call me and contact me and email me on Fridays when they know I got a show coming up. I, I just don't get it. Hey, you know, people you think are your friends, you know, but they don't seem to care. They just uh, want attention or whatever. Okay, let's see. I'm pulling that up here. Oh, come on, damn it. Why is this doing this? I can see the ads. I want to go to pull it up. Okay. There you go. Okay, there's one. God, I got you. Yeah, we go. Okay, we'll be right back after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile cart or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at 1-877-986-7771 and get your sales rolling. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opperman Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to send you a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. Tina Helmuth is writing an ongoing series of fact fiction books that boldly takes on today's most heinous crimes. The abduction, sexual trafficking, and cannibalization of our children. Suffer the little children, the wrath of the father, and unbreakable. Deeply researched and mixed with the supernatural, good versus evil makes these thrillers hard to put down, shining a light on the root cause of these crimes and introducing a spiritual solution. Justice will be served. Available at lulu.com in paperback or ebook. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. 
Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. You know, we keep the show on the air um, through sponsors, you know, through our advertisers and stuff like that. Uh, but also, too, uh, I, I, we're able to keep the show on the air with the with the sponsors and the advertisers. But in order to support me, keep me alive, and keep me with a roof over my head, I, I really like the member section to, to help uh, subsidize my living expenses, you know. Uh, so I pretty much just break even getting on the stations and, and hope that the, it builds up the speaker income, you know, and the income from memberships at OppermanReport.com. So if you haven't renewed your membership lately, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you could and keep us on the air. Because I know a lot of people are really, really, this show's a big part of their life, okay? And I appreciate that. You know, I, I get calls every day. I get emails every day from people. And some of them, I can't even understand what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> you know, and I don't have a lot of time to spend on a list, you know. But I do love you all, and I appreciate your, your support and your efforts. But if you can help keep us on the air, you know, by uh, uh, memberships, you know. And if you're listening on on uh, uh, iHeart or iTunes or one of those different, if you switch over to Spreaker, uh, and I get more plays on Spreaker, uh, I'll, I'll get more income. I, I get some income from the Spreaker ads. It's a big help. And the other thing too is if you do listen on Spreaker, if you can share those uh, uh, when you see the video when you on Twitter or Facebook, if you can like it and share it and retweet it, that would be a big uh, help as well. If we could get those numbers up. Especially now, because Spreaker is doing this thing too, where they they're adjusting the way they count the numbers and plays, uh, so it's making our. It's really funny because the advertising numbers are the same, but it's the numbers that the display show less. But I don't know who cares. So hookers and blow. My experience with hookers and blow. <laughs> okay, I replayed a, an interview I did with this gentleman who was an eyewitness. And this guy swears up and down that he saw Jeffrey Dahmer abduct Adam Walsh at a at that uh, mall in Florida. Now, a lot of people see this and right away they say, oh, Ed, what are you talking about? The Dahmer was never even in Florida. And Dahmer didn't like little boys. He liked the teenage uh, black kids. And everybody's an expert on Dahmer. But we know for an absolute 100% fact, Dahmer was in Florida because he found a dead body at a dumpster in Florida. He reported to the police. <laughs> okay, it's a fact he was not in Florida at this time. That's 100% corroborated. We know that. Okay, and if you listen to the interview, I titled it Witness, uh, uh, Eyewitness uh, Dahmer Abduct uh, uh, Adam Walsh. Listen to the interview. This guy has a really has dedicated his life to this. He's obsessed with it, and he's put together a good case, in my opinion. I'm, and why we? Ha I haven't even talked to this guy. He's probably updated, gotten even more information, especially after being on this show. Because I know the kind of response you get after you come on this show. Now, a lot of people start uh, saying, "Well, you know what." Well, John Walsh, you know, America's Most Wanted. Uh, why doesn't he support this theory? Why does he think Tool did it? Henry Lucas and Tool. And there's a couple little odd things with that, you know. Uh, Lucas and Tool claimed that they were part of this uh, cult. And it was down in Mexico, it was in Florida. And um, the cult of the Black Hand or something like that, right? And uh, they were they were sentenced to be executed, and Bush commuted their execution. The only people he ever prevented from being executed he was one of the biggest, most executing uh, governors in the world, you know, in, in history. Put more people to death than anybody else, except for these two serial killers. So you got to wonder, you know, well, what's going on there? My personal experience with the John Walsh, I think it was 2003, there was a private investigators convention here in Nevada. And I met a lot of people at that convention. I met uh, Judge Napolitano. I took a, a class from him. He gave like a seminar. I met uh, Dr. Henry Lee. I got a picture of me, Dr. Henry Lee. I, I look like I'm 300 pounds in that picture. I look disgusting. <laughs> but... And really was a nice guy. Uh, and I met John Walsh. John Walsh uh, showed up late. 
And I, and I always had my suspicions about John Walsh too. I, I didn't, I didn't like him. I thought, oh, look at this guy making a living and a career off the, the death of his son. It's horrible. You know what kind of person does that? But after listening to his presentation of how he went through, you know, he tells the whole story step by step of everything he went through. Um, I, at that time, came to like him. And he was flown in on the private jet of a gentleman named Hank Asher. Hank Asher was a notorious guy who ran these database companies that um, were the least expensive. Like you could do a search on someone, like a database search, to like a locate, to locate someone, right? Um, for 25 cents, okay? Like right now I'm paying like a dollar fifty two dollars for these searches. But he had them really super cheap because he had this company called TLO. And when you look into his background, Hank Asher... He started out, well, they said, he was, they said he was a painter. He was a paint condominium. He was at a painting company. But, you know, then you, you see, too, he was a private pilot, and he was smuggling cocaine from the Bahamas. And then it talks about how, well, he never got arrested for that, but it talks about how he and F. Lee Bailey uh, started going down to the Bahamas and talking uh, other smugglers to get out of the business, trying to discourage them from being smugglers. Then suddenly he gets into this data mining business, uh, where he starts buying information from the DMV and credit headers and cross-referencing them and all this kind of stuff like that. It's alle- it was alleged that he stole some proprietary software and, and programming skills from ChoicePoint, and he went into this business doing this. Now, uh, fascinating also, too, remember that company, 1-800-US-SEARCH? That company was owned by another character um, that was involved with the the... Heaven's Gate cult. In fact, he discovered the bodies at the Heaven's Gate cult. And uh, the, the, the landlord of that Heaven's Gate cult also rented out uh, homes to some of the 9-11 hijackers. Okay. <laughs> then also to the Finders. The Finders guy, too, who was a pilot, one of the guys involved with the Finders, he was also involved with one of these big database companies, too, as well. So, and, and we find out later on, these database companies, they get their information from credit headers from the three major credit reporting agencies. And we find out later on that those companies are all CIA fronts. And we find out that from the uh, the case of the Falcon and the Snowman. And if you just go back and Google all this stuff in my old shows, I, I, I talk about all these different topics, different times. Oh, boy. So Hank Asher shows up and he flies in uh, uh, Mr. John Walsh to give his presentation. And Hank Asher gives a little presentation too. And it's very obvious that these two had been partying like rock stars for a couple of days. Okay, they were wearing the same clothes they'd been wearing for a couple of days. <laughs> okay, all right. You know, and I'm the kind of guy that can spot that kind of thing. Okay. And Hank Asher, it turns out, had a very interesting background in that uh, his company, and I think it was Choice Point, formed a third company. And the role of this third company, because everyone said, oh my goodness, with this grad there, he's teaming up with ChoicePoint, I'm going to do this big database service, you know. Because these are all services that private investigators subscribe to, saying we all gossip behind the scenes, you know, when people know information, we all know each other. So what's this new company going to be? And they actually put out a press release saying, yeah, we formed a, a joint venture company, but it's not going to be available to the public. It's just for a specific contract down in Florida for the Board of Elections or, or for the, uh, you know, down there in Florida. And what this purpose of this new company was to do was to scrub the voter rolls of people that had felony convictions. And what it did was, let's say you, you, your name was uh, John Henry Smith. Or John Henry Taylor. Let's try that name. John Henry Taylor. And there's a guy with a felony conviction named Henry John Taylor. Or Taylor Henry. Whatever. They would match up all those people with that felony conviction and say, hey, all three of these people with these different variations of these names are not qualified to vote. So a guy, John Henry Taylor, goes to, to vote, and Henry John Taylor goes to vote, and they both have felony convictions attached to their names and not allowed to vote. 
And he did this to help uh, George Bush steal the 2000 election. And Cynthia McKinney looked into this, and she investigated all this when she was a senator. And we, we discussed this on the air, and we discussed it off the air. That guy was friends with the John Walsh. Then uh, after that, when the 9-11 uh, attack happened in New York City, Choice Point was given a, a contract, a DNA database contract of $1 billion to identify the victims at 9-11. And uh, Choice Point, you know, at the time, too, you know, the... the CEO was a former uh, NYPD police uh, commissioner. So you see all the different connections there going on with that. And this Asher had very interesting uh, things going on as well. He inserted himself into the uh, the DC sniper case. And I also have a little connection with that too because the DC snipers had stayed in a hotel um, with this woman I knew, and, and the FBI came in there and they had her run these different names that somehow Asher had come up with. Uh, and he, he knew the names of the DC snipers. He also had some kind of top secret room, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, uh, is this a bomb that the FBI used during the September 11 attacks? You know? <laughs> And he did all these database searches where he, he found other suspects were arrested around September 11. So he's been a lot involved in a lot of stuff behind the scenes, man. That you know you might want to take a look and uh, into this. So that's his. That's the connection between him and John Walsh. They were obviously clearly very close friends. Um, flying around, uh, Hank Asher's dead today. He died, and, and it's interesting too that right after he died and his family took over the business, they were almost immediately audited by the three major credit reporting agencies and put out of business. Shut down. So, whatever's going on there, you want to take a look at it, you know, figure it out for yourself. Uh, who knows? But that's my show, Hookers and Blow. Sandy Hook and, uh, and you know, and F. Lee Bailey, and <laughs> what's his name, Hank Asher. I, you know, if I ever do interview F. Lee Bailey, I'll ask him about Hank Asher, see what, what's going on with those two. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. Good night. Don't forget to become a member. I can't think of anything else to talk about. I don't have any notes. So have a good night. Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile cart or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at 1-877-986-7771 and get your sales rolling. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. Order today at PureSoapFlakes.com. Or give them a call, 218-568-2525, 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. Tina Helmuth is writing an ongoing series of fact fiction books that boldly takes on today's most heinous crimes. The abduction, sexual trafficking, and cannibalization of our children. Suffer the little children, the wrath of the father, and unbreakable. Deeply researched and mixed with the supernatural, good versus evil makes these thrillers hard to put down, shining a light on the root cause of these crimes and introducing a spiritual solution. 
Justice will be served. Available at lulu.com in paperback or ebook. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. <laughs> 